Raw this week delivered quite strongly, probably the most memorable Raw of the year so far. A large part of this due to high quality matchups that sort of came out of nowhere, but mostly an absolutely unmissable main event segment. For PCW, I'm Tom Colihue. Like the video and subscribe if you haven't already, and let's jump into it. The show opened with immediate wrestling, Bobby Lashley taking on Xavier Woods, and it followed a format we're very familiar with. Bobby Lashley essentially dominated the match, whereas Xavier Woods was able to get in quick, brief bursts of offence. It didn't really count in his favour because he was destroyed, and yet somehow, due to a fluke roll-up, ended up with the win. Now initially, this seems like it's just a way to make it look more believable that Kofi Kingston might win at the Money in the Bank, when he really isn't believable as a potential winner, but it actually plays out very differently by the end of the night in a really interesting way. Over the course of the night, several references are made to this and what will happen later. MVP announces that we are going to have a VIP lounge in the main event featuring Bobby Lashley. Meanwhile, The New Day in several segments celebrate their big win. It's just another way that the WWE are trying to make sure we don't change the channel before the end of the three hours. Alexa Bliss interviewed Eva Marie and Piper Niven, still not Dewdrop, Piper Niven, backstage in her playground setting. She did double duty this week because Eva Marie and Alexa Bliss is kind of a feud now. Essentially, Alexa Bliss is trying to make friends with Piper Niven. Meanwhile, Eva Marie is trying to stop her from doing that, and that's basically our entire storyline. It was not a great segment. Jinder Mahal and Drew McIntyre actually had very brief segments this week, and this is a very good thing. It gives Drew a little bit of a breather. Jinder Mahal showed the sword that he had stolen last week, broken, but apparently that wasn't the real one because you never bring the real thing to a Raw show. Drew McIntyre then showed that he had brought the real thing to a Raw show and destroyed Jinder Mahal's motorbike for reasons. Like I say, it's a low pressure feud and this could be good for both men. The female Raw competitors for Money in the Bank, Nikki Cross, Alexa Bliss, Asuka and Naomi all competed in a fatal four-way match which was very good wrestling, though admittedly there was a bit of a mess going on in the middle. Alexa Bliss was distracted by the arrival of Eva Marie and uh, Piper Niven. Piper Niven would pick Alexa Bliss up, run into a barricade, and then just sort of throw her over the top of it. Oh, and then they went to look and she wasn't there anymore. Ooh. One of many reasons I think Alexa Bliss is taking the briefcase because... Ooh. The match continued with just the three women, continued to be very high quality and really high paced. And Nikki Cross it was who picked up the win, pinning Asuka with a roll up to do so. Asuka's firmly on the way down, so I don't mind her taking a couple of losses before she eventually, hopefully, starts being built back up again, and it's good for Nikki that she's getting a clear push here. Naomi, in the meantime, didn't take the loss, and even if she had, it was a triple threat by the end of it, so not that embarrassing for anyone involved. The beginning of the second hour was all Viking Raiders and AJ Styles vs Amos. This was moderately predictable, but not in a bad way. Ivar picked up the win over Styles in their one-on-one -on -one match, and Omos picked up the win over Eric in their one-on-one -on -one match. Omos is the guy we're pushing, so this makes perfect sense. I don't think anyone's going to be unhappy with this, and they have now announced that we're going to see a tag title match for Raw on Money in the Bank in place of Bianca Belair versus Bailey. I definitely don't think the Viking Raiders are going to be winning this, but I do think this has been a very good feud for them since they came back to really help them establish who they are again. Sheamus, who was due to wrestle Humberto Carrillo, beat the crap out of Humberto Carrillo backstage. This is because Sheamus is not fully cleared for in-ring return yet, and certainly not to take any bumps. So what happened instead is he got the attack on Humberto Carrillo. Carrillo would then come down to the ring for the match, take the bro kick and the loss just like that. Sheamus continued the beatdown afterwards, but Carrillo was protected by Damian Priest. Damian Priest is now basically going to be the surrogate for Keith Lee, walking into the feud with Sheamus. I think this would be a very good match for SummerSlam, and it's good to see that Damien Priest is being used again. If you're wondering where he's been, about two months ago I uploaded a video on my personal YouTube detailing why he wasn't being used and what the plans were going forwards. Our third hour draw segment was a Falls Count Anywhere match between Ricochet and John Morrison. Usually it's Charlotte Flair, so I'm glad they've swapped things around due to the nature of being pre-taped. They could swap some matches over based on how they deliver. And yeah, this match really delivered. Both men we know can perform absolute miracles with their bodies, and they did so, really making everyone involved look very, very good. And there was a wonderful moment when Riddle came down after being annoyed backstage by Miz and Morrison to just tip Miz onto his back like a turtle. It was quite fun. I enjoyed that. 
Ricochet picked up the win after a frog splash onto Morrison through a ladder. And if this is our raw preview for Money in the Bank, I'm genuinely excited a lot more for Money in the Bank. This is the right way to do it, to give us something involving a ladder, to give us some high flying, to remind us of how good these matches can be. That's how you psych us up, not with people disappearing from Fatal 4 ways. Natalia, who was about to wrestle Rhea Ripley, decided alongside Tamina to pick a fight with Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. They didn't pick a fight back. But we have at least been reminded that, hey, they're supposed to be in a tag team championship feud. Natalia versus Rhea was actually a very good match, 10 minutes and probably the best work that Ripley has done on the main roster so far. Largely because she worked to Natalia's strengths rather than someone else working to hers. Ripley showed that she can really go in a wrestling capacity in a technical sense and not just as a powerhouse and it really added a new string to her bow for the viewers. Natalia was very good money for it showing why she deserves to be in the Money in the Bank ladder match herself and really showing that she can get a great match out of anyone. Rhea took a beating but still managed to pick up the win clean, pinning Natalia for the free after a rib tide. After this and during her celebration Charlotte Flair attacked in pretty high heels because Charlotte Flair always attacks in heels, hit the knee again, locked in the figure four, off the edge of the apron to really do as much damage as possible. Credit goes to Rhea Ripley literally biting down on the rope to keep from screaming. That is a good sell. Charlotte standing tall here definitely suggests that she's not going to be standing tall come money in the bank, but Rhea Ripley's body is uh, suffering worse and worse, particularly in that knee, basically since she debuted. Finally, our main event segment was the VIP lounge, where Bobby Lashley arrived in an open suit, not quite as, uh, as dapper as usual, shall we say, not oozing the drip, as it were, in WWE speak nowadays. Instead, he came down with intensity demolished everything in the ring and said to MVP you are holding me back now if you're gonna stick around start getting serious MVP the emotion on his face was absolutely incredible this was easily the strongest promo that Bobby Lashley has ever cut in a WWE ring and shows the development that he's made recently that we've in fact been talking about here the frustrations that Lashley is having with MVP are not new. It's been sort of fizzling in the background since WrestleMania and really shows that Lashley could become a very strong face solo. He's got everything he needs now. He doesn't necessarily need a faction, but I wouldn't be against him keeping MVP either. It would allow MVP to help develop other talent as well. For example, to go back to Shelton and Benjamin for a little while, maybe work with someone else and develop them. There's a number of people that he could use and sort of develop very well. Bobby Lashley's there. Lashley doesn't need MVP. He's just keeping him to stay a heel. As for the rest of the show, the wrestling quality was extremely good. A large part of this being that they could refilm anything that didn't really take. The Falls Count Anywhere match in particular was match of the night easily. Though Rhea vs Natalia and the women's Fatal 4-Way were still very good matches. Xavier Woods had a very good look going into this, and honestly, the way they subtly use Matt Riddle, Damian Priest, and the like, just reminds us that they are actually starting to make stars. Now admittedly, we didn't see Jeff Hardy, he lost on main event, we didn't see a continuation of Mansoor or Ali, but we have a number of storylines going on now that I think are just a bit more exciting than we've had over the past few weeks. This was of course the end of the Thunderdome as well, I was hoping they would break all of the damn thing, but nothing was broken. I feel they could have done more with that end of the Thunderdome era, but this felt like a standard go home raw, enjoyable wrestling, decent storyline development, and it's made me more excited for Money in the Bank. For PCW, I've been Tom Collihue. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.